So I'm going to talk about growing Grok, and then more specifically Grok the Goblin, which we've rebranded just recently. So a bit about me first. My name is Magnus Holm. I'm a principal engineer at Santi, and I should just clarify first that I typically go just by Holm at Santi, because it turns out there's another Magnus, and he happens to be the CEO. Uh, so often you will see me just mention as Holm. Uh, but I will also reply to Magnus. I'm very, I'm very open for anything. You can call me whatever you want. It, it's going to be fine. And I've been working here for three years. I've been doing quite a lot uh, with Grok, uh, in addition to the rest of the team. And I'm going to talk a bit about Grok. And uh, we all know that Grok is a goblin, uh, but it's also it's really about just giving you all the power to actually work with your data. Uh, and I think it links very much well into what was mentioned in the previous talk about like putting stuff into your content lake. And then it's all about that you can just put the stuff there and then you you have the, then you know that you can get it out in the right way and get just the data you need. Uh, for instance, for performance reasons. So more specifically, uh, when we talk about Grok, we say that it's a query language. Uh, so maybe not all of you here have, been, have seen, looked into Grok yet, if you're new to it, so I thought I'd just like go through a tiny example, um, and then it's fine if you don't understand everything. This is like a it's it's a complicated thing because it's a it's a completely new query language, uh, which is uh, which is complicated, and that is fine. So this is an example of a Grok query, uh, and what this more concretely does is that it uh, goes through all of our posts uh, in our studio, and then it finds everything that's been written by me. Sorry about that example. Uh, and then it sorts them by and uh, when it's been published and gives up some data. So the way we typically think about this Grok queries is that um, even though it's very flexible and you can do whatever you want, you will see that most queries have like a very common shape. And this shape is, it starts with a star uh, because the star is about all of your content. And then it goes on with a filter, which is about getting the content you need so that you only get the tiny bit of content you're interested in. And then it goes about getting only the fields you're interested in. And then maybe you do some ordering and uh, make sure you get in the, in the right order. So all of this is to kind of enable you to just to make sure your front end gets only the data it needs and that you can be super, super flexible. So for instance, in this case, you see that like I'm actually filtering by my name, which is stored in a separate document and authors is actually an array. There can be multiple authors. So in essence, this is doing quite complicated stuff. Uh, and it's all available for you to easily get out. And I, I know what you're all saying if you're seeing this for the first time, or maybe the second time as well. Um, and that is, oh no, this is yet another thing to learn. It's like another thing we need to uh, we need to know. And uh, and I can see that uh, it is uh, it is annoying to learn new things. And actually, from our perspective. Uh, we also are kind of annoyed. It's like, for us, this was another thing to invent. We didn't want to invent this. It would be much better if we didn't have to invent this. Uh, because we actually think like there are other great stuff out there, uh, but they are just not good enough for our use case. So SQL, it's great. We use it a lot, but it is just like really, really clunky for any sort of JSON. Um, and GraphQL, it's also great. Um, but it's honestly, it's not, it's not really a query language in the traditional sense of what we call the query language, because the whole purpose of a query language is that you give all the flexibility to the developer to get the exact data it needs, uh, to the front of the developer to get all the data it needs, but the GraphQL is very much limited, uh, in that sense. So even though they call themselves a query language, it's not, it's not really a query language, but we still think it's great. So all of this cost us to basically, yeah, we realized we need another thing and that another thing became Grok. And when we look at Grok, we think that Grok is pretty good um, and it solves some real needs. And uh, like, as you saw in the query before, you can do quite complicated stuff, but we're also very much aware that it is really, really far from perfect. And therefore, we should make it better. We should improve it. And this is what we've been uh, starting uh, doing, or we have tried to do, and it's been like a long, a long project. 
longer than you than you think maybe uh, because a lot has been going on behind the scenes um and then what you see now or may have seen is that a few weeks ago we released a new version which adds some new functionality so there are a bunch of new functions so string starts with string split and then some array functions and then some math functions so all of this is available today you can use them and you can do more cool stuff with Doc. So it's becoming a bit better. And actually, I thought I would show like some examples of these just to show like how they can be useful and maybe show some some cool grok. And I'm gonna also talk a bit more about sort of the process behind here. So uh, array join is a very simple function, which you might have seen in many other languages. It's the standard join function, which we have in like Python and Ruby and many other languages as well. And what it does is that it takes in an array of strings and then it concatenates them together and puts a delimiter in between. So for instance, one use case you could have for this is that you might want to get all of your blog posts out. And when they have multiple authors, you just want to combine them with a comma. So that you just get one string for all of the all of your authors. And now with the array join, you can very easily uh, accomplish this. Um, of course, for me personally, it's always like a tricky question whether you want to do this inside Grok or whether you want your front end to get all the data, like get the raw data, and then you do this on the front end side. And sometimes it just depends. And there's, uh, from my perspective, there's really no right answer. Sometimes you want to get the raw data. Sometimes it's nice to get the uh, more uh, derived data, if you could say it that way. Uh, but we hope this will be helpful in those cases where we realize like, ah, I don't really want all of this raw data. I just like, just give me the authors with a comma in between. But honestly, it can't be that hard. And now it isn't. And also when I wrote up this example, I realized, uh, I realized that another common way of writing authors um, is, or when you write list is that you do a comma separated list. And then you have and, and then you have the last element. So I figured, shouldn't we also be able of, of solving that? Um, and this is where I think like the sort of the power of Grok shines because you could imagine that, oh, to do this, you would use another function. You would have like join with and or something like that. But with Grok, we don't actually need to do that. We can actually solve this just by using array join and some more complicated stuff in between. So yeah, if you're new to Grok, this might seem even more complicated, but I, I don't think it's too bad. It reads quite sensibly. So this is like an example where first we just fetch out all of the authors. We get those author as a, just as a string of array, uh, array of string. And then at the end here, we check first for the case where if it's a single author, we just need to handle that specially, and then we just return that author names. And otherwise we will take every name except the last one, combined with the comma, add the end, and then add the last thing. So by just writing all of this code, and then you can run it against our blog, and you will see how it will nicely show a single authors properly, and with two authors, there's an and, and then the three authors, there's also the comma. So once again, you could question whether you should be doing this in your queries or whether you want to rather do it in the front end, uh, but it's like pretty cool to show that it's possible and that you can actually like solve these needs um because sometimes it can really simplify what you're doing on the front end and we think that's like a pretty cool use case um and yeah i'm going through this very briefly so feel free to ask in the chat more about how this actually works um later on i will uh, i will reply as well um yeah and then let's also talk about array unique so array unique is a function which takes in an array and then it removes all duplicates. And at first, when you hear about that, you will wonder like, why is that useful? Like I don't have duplicates in my arrays. So why would I, why would I care about that? Why would I remove duplicates? That's not so common. Uh, but there is one use case, which is like very useful. Uh, and that is this expression you see here. If you write star dot underscore type, uh, star is your whole data set dot underscore type means give me the type for the whole data set. And that would be like one big array for every document in your data set. And if you then unique that, 
you get a nice list of all the types in your data set. And this for me is like the first time, like when I get access to the new Sentry data sets, I would just always run this query. I would just like run this, look at the types, and then you can learn, you can learn so much. You can learn about these different types and uh, and how they work. And it's like, it's like the first way of like understanding the schema is just understanding the types. And then you see a bit more what's actually in here. Uh, and this array unique also works with like subtypes. If you have a portable text, you can run it on all of the blocks and you can figure out like, oh, what are all the custom blocks you have here? Uh, which is a nice way of looking at the actual data uh, as opposed to only looking at the schema. So this array unique, it's a super cool trick, which I use uh, just a lot. Mm, and finally, to give another cool example, string starts with um, is a function which takes in two strings, and then it returns true if the uh, first string starts with the second string. Uh, so this is often, it's very useful for filtering, and there are just like some use cases, for instance, with internationalization, where you might want to use documents where at the end you have like the language uh, as a part of the ID, and then you can use start with to find all documents or all of the languages for a single version of the content. Uh, this was an example I saw a customer used and asked about where they have a content of a document version, and then they wanted to figure all of their document of the version 1.0 to get them up to 1.1, for instance. Um, so this is one of those where, like, uh, I, I don't feel like it comes up that often, but when it comes up, it solves like a really, really neat problem. Okay, so there are also like a, a bunch of these of these functions, and you also saw the math functions. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of this, but I'm going to talk a bit more about Grok itself, uh, because as you see in here, you've seen like these functions, and you can see that uh, Grok is, is growing a bit, and they have more functionality. But to me, actually, the more important thing that's happening is that it's growing up. And uh, what I mean by that is that uh, not only did we announce these functions and release these functions, we also made a bunch of other changes. So uh, we have the spec of Grok, which we actually started uh, a year ago. Uh, but now we have finally uh, released a version which is like fully specified and describes exactly how Grok should behave. Uh, and this is actually quite a lot of work. Like this is all in the open. It's open source. Anyone can use it. And it's like 2,000 lines of markdown, which is a lot of markdown. Uh, and this describes the exact semantics of how Grok behaves. And while we wrote this, we uncovered lots of like edge cases and we had to figure out how Grok actually should behave. And for us, it's like very important to make sure that we can add more functionality into Grok and still make sure everything is like consistent and that we don't introduce bugs or weird behavior. And slightly related to this is also that we have a Grok test suite. So this is like a, an open source repo, anyone can check it out. And there we have currently 9,000 tests, which shows like this Grok should give this result. And we will continue adding. I think we were like 4,000 a few weeks ago. So we're adding more and more. Um, and this can be used for anyone to like double check. And if anyone else wants to implement Grok, they are free to do that. And also very importantly, we have an open source JavaScript implementation. So this one as a part of growing up is now released in a stable version 1.0.0. And also we just released a 1.1.0. So this is now considered stable to be used and it's uh, has a public API that you can trust, and you can take Grok queries and you can execute them wherever you want. So all of these functions that you saw before, they are very cool and you can use them today. But for me personally, like these changes here, like with having a proper spec that we can update, having a test suite running nicely, having the open source Grok JavaScript implementation, all of this just means like we are able to actually grow Grok even further. And I do hope that we can make even cooler stuff uh, into Grok in the, in the coming months. That is definitely my, uh, my goal uh, with all of these changes. So yes, that's what I had. I'm very interested in uh, how it went. Um, it, went it went very well. <laughs> the community loves it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I have a question. So there's a lot of new functions. Were a lot of these like community asks or were these just ones that 
we knew we wanted to add or? Um, I mean, the, the real secret here is that these were actually uh, implemented way back. Uh, they actually mm. been internally implemented like a year ago or something. And they were then partly based on community needs and partly based on other requests. And then what's actually taking the long time is double checking everything and making sure they are, uh, they are solid. Um, but we do also have a, an internal list of proposals and other changes, which are like tracked with what the community is asking for. So there is an open source, uh, there is a repo called Grok where you can open issues. And we do, if you upload anything there, we do count them and we look at them and uh, we will try to prioritize uh, accordingly. Um, but we will also have to focus on uh, sometimes lower hanging fruits over what is being most uh, upvoted because some of the most upvoted ones are really tricky and requires time. So follow up to that, what's like the oh. average time it takes to make a new uh, function for Grok? Yeah, I mean, that's why like the average time is a very bad number because now we spent like a year fixing the spec, and but now mm. the spec is uh, proper. So now we're going to see how quickly we can do stuff. So now yeah. it's going to be like the real test. Um, but it's always like, it's a super tricky thing because like once we add a function, we're stuck with it forever. So sometimes it's not really about adding it. It's about re realizing or understanding that it's a good thing to add. Uh, because if we later realize, oh, this is very hard to optimize or it has some weird behavior and it's going to be confusing, we still have to support it for years. Uh, so for us, like the reason things take a long time, it's not necessarily because it's difficult. It's just because like we're unsure whether it's the right thing. And, and yeah, it's a, it's a very tricky trade-off when you build, build a language. Yeah, that makes sense. I have a great one from the community like here from Kisha. She asked, what's your top five? And yeah, she just <laughs> bumped it down five? to top three favorite <laughs> rock functions. What's your three favorite rock that functions? New that or already old? exists or, or doesn't exist? Hey, if you want to tell us what's going to be implemented <laughs> next, that's that's cool. No, yeah, yeah. New or legendary? Yeah. So the one thing I'm hoping most for is uh, we have like this, and this has not really been uh, properly sketched out, and um, it might not happen. But uh, there is something about solving this uh, dereferencing problem or duplication problem, where, for instance, with portable text, you use the same, like uh, you 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 have the same portable text multiple places, and it for the same types, and just to get like the asset files, we need to do like the reference and create many of these, like something there. Uh, we have some ideas there. And uh, to be able to solve that, that I feel is like a very, uh, very important and very nice. Um, so I have some ideas there that I like to play with and see. Um, and I think that was going to be very cool and solve some real needs. Um, and but yeah, about favorite features for me, it's it's a lot easier to talk about the least favorite features because I'm uh, these are the ones that kind of annoys me, and those are unfortunately the ones I think about more and I'm trying to avoid that we make the same mistakes in the future. So unfortunately, it's uh, like all of the complicated edge cases are the ones that I know more about than the cool stuff. You want to Sadly. point what something out specifically, or should we just? That's annoying. Uh, I mean, like the the whole array array traversal logic when you do like a square bracket and dot and another square bracket, it works pretty well, but it's super complicated behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, and it's like it's kind of strange because it's intuitively it works okay, and often you can just you can just write what you think, and it works out to be correctly. But the rules behind there are just so so messy and so strange. So um, yeah. All yeah. right, we got the last that. one from Cody. Uh, when can we get syntax highlighting for Grok on GitHub? Uh, uh, I, I assume uh, that's up to when? you. When? Oh wow! Yeah, yeah, that's all up to me. I'm gonna pick a deadline right now. And uh, no, I'm gonna have to be very diplomatic and say that yeah, yeah we're going to have to look into that. All right. Um, yeah, thank you once again. There's a lot of action <laughs> in the in the meetup channel, so so do go have a look. Yeah, yeah, um, I will. And uh, thank you so much for this great presentation. Yeah, thank yeah. you, Mom. Thank you for uh, thank you for inviting me. All right, see you.